All right, tell me, tell me if I can start the podcast now. I don't actually don't do anything if I can start the podcast now. Welcome to Hacking Business Technology. You should all freeze like on on Top Gun and just what was that? What was that show called? Not Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what show it is. You oh, you're, all... Are you not thinking of Naked the Gun? Exactly. Naked Gun. Oh. That's the movie I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's lots of shows that use that, and it's a terrible technique. And, uh, the, the one was Zach, um, back, something it's high school related. They had um, the really nerdy guy with the curly hair. Yeah, it sounds like a Nickelodeon show, which I would never have watched. <laughs> terrible. Absolutely terrible when they stop like that. So welcome to uh, Tag Business Technology. We've got Barbara Tula here. She hasn't been here in a few weeks. Thank you for being here, and we've got Matt Hooper, he's in a bachelor pad somewhere else. I am in my bachelor pad, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You'd see those things on the counter instead of food and dishes. <laughs> it's expensive. That's kind of how guys are forever. Forever. <laughs> got a I run the road every surface. week. I, and I don't, I don't mean to be a gender stereotypist, um, but... It doesn't matter. What was key is that he said it's expenses from September, and I think... I don't think I've met anyone who still struggles with this stupid receipt concept of expenses. Like, man, we need to fix that. It's awful. Well, American Express just released this new feature so that you can now go into your credit card and you can take a photo of your receipt and it'll automatically map it there. And then you can put a printout. It will show the credit card statements, check all the ones you want with the pictures of the receipt so you can just push that off to... Okay. That's you sexy. Know. We need more of that. Yes. It's getting closer. Getting closer. It needs to be 100% digital. <laughs> Kill paper. Exactly. No more paper. That is nice. Yeah, that is kind of handy. Actually. It's a good feature. I wish that I could tell American Express at the time of purchase whether this is business or personal and just have it just poof. Right. Set a preference. Or, I mean, I guess they, I mean, the technology is there. If you think about Apple Pay or any of these other things, I mean, you just, when you even square or whatever that you No, I want, it, I want it even a step further. I want to say I'm in a mode. I'm in I'm in business traveling mode, so yeah. everything everything I'm going to swipe from here out is getting expensed. I love it. Yeah, that works for some people, but like some of my stuff isn't covered, right? Well, because like, lap, lap dances aren't expensive. Exactly, and like <laughs> my my twentieth my nineteenth beer is exp is expensive, but my twentieth beer is not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I could never get to that point. I would black out. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen that um, spoof video about uh, sales? And, and the guy goes off about lap dance, dance is not being expensed. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. It's a great if you if you, in any way whatsoever you're involved in sales. It's this is a must must see classic video. Terrible part of organizations. People have to <laughs> talk about that stuff. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. So uh, in real news, in real things that are happening, not just stories. Actually, Hooper and I were just talking about this before the show about how people need to understand stories, and I. I started this concept where uh, I'm not very good at, at uh, doing ROIs, right? Like, how much will it save us if we switch to such and such a product or change a process so and so how? So I've, I've taken on a new approach, and that's writing scripts. So what I'll do is I'll just tell the story of how it is today and then tell the story of how it is tomorrow and then have people literally, like, act it out using those tools. Powerful. Love it. That's exactly what I just did. I, I wrote this, uh, a, truly a narrative. I started off, here's the characters, and here's the play theme. And I called it scene one and scene two and scene three and what the actors are doing. Yeah. It's actually, it's, it's, it's really effective, actually. I've been doing something similar with my, uh, my teams for my current project where in our show me sessions, every two weeks after the end of the sprint where we kind of demo what we've been doing, we do a lot of that scenario based to say we kind of do a side by side so in the demo slide it'll say here's what you're doing today here's the to be state right and what's what's new and different and kind of do exactly that but play it out in a scene if you will so you I know I what it is that. it's demo day for process absolutely because you know I think especially in what we do with some of our service management stuff we, it's so easy to get caught up into the tool and the tool features right but this way, by doing this scenario-based approach where you're actually orchestrating the actors, the scene, the whole use case, 
you're now showcasing what you're training, what you're changing from a, both a process and tool perspective. And I think that really tells a much, much better story that's more holistic. It can help with org change, too. Like, you're starting to help them envision the future. I think, like, uh, the part that I like about Demo Day is when, and no one will talk about this, especially people in trusting organizations, but people uh, who do, teams that do have that trust, when someone falls on their face during a demo, like, they just, like, didn't do a simple JavaScript, like they just got syntax wrong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and application developers see that, they just love seeing that, and they love seeing people going through those challenges and falling on their faces. We, we need processes to fall on their face, too, so that people understand how terrible they are. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I learned about uh, user experience with Smack was sometimes you have to give them a prototype. You have to let them see something and then watch them. Put things where you think they're going to be and see where they go. And actually, there's a tool called Mockingbird. I'll put, a, I'll put a show notes in there. But it's, um, it's wireframing. You just wireframe how you think it should go and let people real time kind of click things. And in fact, one, one user experience shop I went to, they actually would have little cardboard pieces in a box next to the person. So if they didn't see a button that they wanted, they let them go into the box and pull it out and put it there. That's so they could awesome. Stick it, they could stick it on the sheet and then say, okay, I want it to go here when I click it. Hot. Uh, yeah. Preach. Amen, brother. Legos, Legos needs to come up with an ITIL kit, right? <laughs> It'll no, be a it huge won't. seller. It'll be a huge... No, it won't. <laughs> Just like the, well, remember the ABC cards that Paul Wilkinson and uh, Gaming Works did, right? So it had the ABC. Yes, I just saw one in the presentation. Yeah, of ICT. So, you know, I don't know. It would be interesting to get him on a show one day and figure out how is this whole card game working? Is it effective? I mean, gaming, we you know there was a whole period where gamification and simulations really took off speed, and now you hear nothing. People don't have time. Well, his, I think, works because he's addressing a culture. So when someone says something that's really stupid, instead of looking at them like, you're really stupid, they go, hey, you know something? I actually have a card for that. And then you pull out a card, you hand them, and then they read it, and then they realize, boy, I'm really stupid. <laughs> Which is such a better organizational change thing than someone else telling them, right? They come to their own realization. Of their well, that's how, that is the only true way that learning exists, is coming to the conclusion yourself. If you tell someone, they, they may say that they get it, but they're like, they kind of are just not, they want to resist it. Right, and, but you, and you hit on such an important point, because between that and Mockingbird, what I love about it is so many times, especially in consulting, right, I, find, I come across it all the time, they don't just trust in you saying, take my word for it, you want this to work in A, B, C, and D, right? They're just, they'll push back, they think, oh, the consultant's just trying to throw something down my throat. So another great approach that we've used, especially in, in, the, you know, in some of the challenges I faced over the last few months is, all right, let's do it your way, let's prototype it, exactly that, and I really love that, that idea of putting that wire mesh together. But what we've seen is by letting them kind of do it their way and then stepping through a use case, they're like, oh, yeah. Maybe it didn't make sense. And so then we have an opportunity to open up a conversation about how they can do things a little differently. So extremely powerful. Yeah, it, it's like I've been on this big kick, and I wrote a blog about it, about how the PMO office just needs, you know, project management office just needs to go away. Right? It just needs to go away. And projects are nothing but major requests, and we just need a concept of, of, of containerizing milestones and tasks. But that should all exist within our service management platform. It's just the planned work part of our managed service platform instead of the unplanned work, which we spend so much time on. We don't need a separate tool. We don't need separate. And when I talk to people about this, they say, well, that wouldn't work. I'm like, okay, show me why it won't work. And mm -hmm. they start going in and building milestones and putting requests and tasks in place and showing the dependencies. And when they finish, I turn around and I show them, a project to change to request to task, and I say, okay, that looks just like we have already in our service management tool. So I'd rather think about it for me as the person who gets the work done. I don't want two places to look, one place to look, and let me prioritize my planned versus unplanned work. I might have 10 unplanned things that I'm so focused on, if I saw them in the same queue, I could say, hey, this one planned thing actually gets rid of those 10 things. 
Yeah, I think what you're saying, though, is you want the PMO and you don't want ITSS. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, no, what I really want is I want to get off of this, hey, it's going to be a framework thing and focus on it's all activities. Results. Or, or awful want, joke um, warning, disclaimer, if you combine the two, it becomes a PMSO. <laughs> Just do it. Just do the work. Just we're not gonna ha we're not gonna hashtag women in IT for that. <laughs> oh, come on now. There's a line, and you can't cross over the line. <laughs> Speaking of lines, they found water on Mars, or so they say. And it's actually it was a student that discovered it. Mars doesn't exist. That's media hype. Awesome. <laughs> I do not like the media. The media just needs to go away. So we will not it's, talk about the media. We will call it that who shall not be named. It's the it's the same production company who showed those guys landing on what they call the moon. <laughs> Terrible. You conspiracy theorists. There's no, there's no shortage of Hooper uh, Hooper sarcasm this week. He's been on by, uh, back to ITSM. I think you had like post of the year. No, I think it's because <laughs> he's in the bachelor change, pad. Change management. <laughs> He's been reading too many of Ryan Ogilvie's blog. Dude, that dude has a new blog post like every day now. He, he posts them actually. On I was with Ryan this week. He posts them on LinkedIn. So if you follow any groups that he's in, like, you can actually just get alerts that way. It's a so I was, in, I was in Calgary speaking at an ITSM event, and, and Ryan and I were then he was supposed to join us for dinner uh, later. And the poor guy, um, he was breaking down the booth and was supposed to put it in a woman's car who was part of the ITSM organization. And her husband said, oh, it'll all fit. And the, the wife said, no, it won't. And she listened to her husband. What woman does that anymore? <laughs> why, why would they do that? So it didn't fit, and the poor guy had to drive it 40 minutes to drop it off. And then by the time he got back to Calgary, it was... Uh... Cartage. Freight, freight shipping is really expensive. I don't know if you know <laughs> really that. Expensive. It is and wicked. Farad, Farad's brother doesn't live in Calgary anymore, so I didn't get a chance to see him. He's living in Manhattan, right? Uh, yeah. No, he actually then shifted, so now he's in California. Look at that. He's just uh, he's a little... rambling man. Yeah, he is. He is. <laughs> I don't think that phrase means what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 in it, 1970, it, it meant what I meant. <laughs> Born a rambling man. Now I got that song stuck in my head. Uh, really interesting video I watched this week about how uh, computers are going to take over every single person's job. I don't think that anyone on this podcast actually will refute that fact. But it, it's an interesting video. I think you should definitely watch it, especially like if you disagree with that statement. Because I did disagree with this statement slightly. But it was like, compelling, though, wasn't it? It's I compelling. watched the video. It was well, pretty much. Yeah, the, uh, I, you know... I think the part that really got me was the creativity bit because I think that's something that I've always said in my head. Like, as long as you can think creatively and innovative, as long as you can be innovative, you should be employable, right? Yeah. That's the thing. That's exactly it. So I think what it takes over is those tasks and those things that become routine or menial or recipe-esque or something that fits a certain logic pattern, right? And so in this video, well, though, Ross... Thank they you. say they say specifically in this video that uh, computers are becoming creative as well. There was, a, there was a song they played that was completely generated by computer, and it's gorgeous. It's and people beautiful. people can't tell one over the other. And yeah. You gotta watch it. Just watch it. I'll put it in the show notes. Or the robot that watches and learns. It watches you do something and then mimics you, and, and then from there on it learns what you just did. Kind of like that new creepy teddy bear that Fisher Price just watched. <laughs> yeah. It's all coming down. Yeah, so definitely watch it and then uh, agree. Uh, po post a comment. I'd like to know what you think about it. I, I think that what your conclusion is after it. <laughs> I think that's what I want people to come to is the conclusion that I came to at the end of it. That uh, that we're we're a messed up world because they have all of that capability and yet we can't even get passwords automated to be reset. <laughs> or like or world, 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 world hunger service request. <laughs> uh, violence. Well, why don't we have technology telling us how to solve the violence problem or solve the starvation problem or 
or, or solve the finance problems. We have incredibly powerful technology that apparently is going to put us all out of jobs, but is it going to create a better world? Well, in the video they talked about food production and, and, and how it's so massive, but the, the problem with starvation is it has nothing to do with food capacity. It has nothing to do with innovation. It's completely political. Political. Correct. I completely agree with Matt. So then how do we get technology to fix politics? Um, eliminate the politicians and let technology tell us what to do. Fantastic. <laughs> That sounds a little Skynet-ish, but I'm willing to I'm willing to work with our new robotic overlords. Eagle eye. <laughs> yeah. So in uh, in more relevant world, <laughs> the, uh, I saw a release from Puppet Labs that they are putting out this new application orchestration product. So Puppet, who has been focused on operating system and infrastructure deployment is now getting into the game of pre-built business logic apps. So I think that's interesting because we have, we have seen this microservice of containers start to be built. It almost becomes the, uh, we, we joked many years ago about 3D printers who made 3D printers. Mm -hmm. We are now seeing configuration software containers that can build six, you know, software containers for configuration. And that's, Kind of interesting, I think. It's going to change the game on what I tweeted today was application discovery and mapping tools. Because if my software is creating the configuration, then it already knows what the configuration is. It never has to discover. It always has the latest and greatest uh, information about it. It's always correct. We were always swivel seating. I'd, I would build the system, then I would document the system. And so why don't we have a computer do both of those? Yeah, now you document the system and it builds it. Yeah. And it deploys it, and it tracks it, and measures it, it monitors it, it tests it, it validates it, it watches the end user experience, it self repeals, it self heals. It's autonomic. Autonomic. Autonomicon. It's interesting. I, I'm curious to see which other vendors follow suit. Because uh, it's definitely a compelling reason to, to choose Puppet over so many other configuration management tools out there, Chef. Yeah, and then how many consumers decide that they want to go for it, right? Leading edge, bleeding edge, skeptics. Those. It still blows my mind at how many people are still skeptical to do something, you know, to automate some of which they still have. I mean, I struggle with people understanding cloud. <laughs> blows my mind, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the companies that, uh, you know, are willing to accept those things are already uh, reading about it from us, kind of, uh, or, or just from news releases or paying attention to, to Hacker News on Y Combinator. But uh, there are companies. Uh, Tar Target in Minneapolis has been hiring an incredible amount of talent, um, some of which has been there for, like, 15 or 20 years. They've actually worked there, and they've been trying to get DevOps for, like, I, I did an interview with a guy, and he said, uh, I'm not job interview, just like I was talking to a dude. Um, for, 14 years ago, he said that we should be switching to this new way of working. We should be switching to Agile, and we should be switching to DevOps. And I think uh, they're probably going to look at it. Because they've got what they've done. They can't is, afford not to. Yeah, the good, the good companies realize that they can't afford not to, and what they've done is they've built these labs or these you know, other business units kind of that do with that experimentation stuff. CenturyLink's another uh, local example in the Minneapolis area. Curious and to it, see. It, it makes no surprise to me that companies like Target and Walmart and other manufacturing organizations embrace this because we're, we've seen this trend of, of productive successful uh, line of business managers taking over IT. We've also seen IT move into their lines of business. And what the, the way that you become a successful line of business manager in manufacturing is eliminate waste. It's all about productivity gains. If you can save, you can save three and a half percent a year, you're getting a promotion. Yeah, and in those low margin markets, it definitely makes a lot of sense. It'd be interesting to see how how long it takes the financial sector and how long it takes the uh, the healthcare sectors to pick it up. I think education will get it pretty fast too because they tend to be pretty bleeding edge. 
Yeah. For the most part, but, but I, again, yeah, you're right. I think, but if you look at, there's large corporations, and then there's this huge, I guess, gap in the middle, right? Of people still stuck, and that's where a, a large majority of our workforce is. That's where a lot of our business is too, right? And that's where it's, it's just, it's so interesting to me to see how slow they all still move, in general. Yeah, I, was, I wish. Well, I, you worked for Emory. Mm -hmm. So you can provide some perspective on that. I wish Mark was here too. He could provide some perspective on this. I find higher ed to not really be leading edge as much as I find them to be more risk tolerant. Agreed. Because I still find a lot of people they're very stodgy or they're not just they're not as up to date. It's but tenure, if, right? They they're very comfortable with things the way yeah. that they are because that's the way they've always been, right? Um, even something as simple as I remember going to even consider something like Box or Google. That was a very long process, right? Yeah. To, get, to get people convinced. I mean, universities are still whispers. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to convince you to say process. <laughs> <laughs> process. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. I wonder that I like the way that uh, Hooper said that that they're or did you say that they're more risk tolerant? So what is the difference between risk tolerant and innovative? I, I sort of those seem similar at least to me. So I find I find that if a if a university can get that new shiny object really cheap they will somehow bring it into their environment. It, it uh, may not instantly go on production, but right. somewhere, somehow, it will get. It will find a place to live and be played with. And maybe maybe support a little small piece of operations. And right. maybe not necessarily deployed for a very long time across the enterprise. So you have multiple things that are doing the same thing, and that's okay. Yeah. So. That's cool. I like that. Though I've noticed that the game, particularly in certain places, like you know, in Alberta or in Canada where, where now privacy of student information has become such a focal point for their systems. Um, they become more diligent about verification of vendors and data storage and where it's going to be. So if you are a SaaS provider, you have to have a Canadian data center, so forth, so on. But, um, but it is, you know, it is something that I see that they, they, they are not... A, You'll, you'll find there's usually a, a, a real unique situation where they have this massive change for organizational management. Um, and uh, U of A, which was one of my clients years ago, that was the situation. The, the CIO, Trevor Woods, super forward thinker. He had a guy, Keith McKinnon, super sharp and exactly what he wanted to do. It was take no prisoners. He was moving forward, would make decisions on the fly in meetings, and you know both of those guys now have moved on to other worlds, but yet that momentum is still continued. And oh. It's interesting. It's very That's much the goal. If you take the Alberta oil and gas market, then you go back to exactly that. They move a lot slower, and they're a lot more inefficient. Yeah. And those big industries. Mm-hmm. And what's funny too that I, I've noticed uh, with with that industry is that during the times where they have the money to spend, because of their analysis paralysis, they don't spend it. Exactly. Then, they, then when they find themselves in the situation they are now, which is they're hemorrhaging for cash. Exactly. It yeah. is a brutal nightmare. They are they are <laughs> they're losing they're losing the good talent because they can't sustain the work environment. And, and when they have the cash, they didn't take that the that's the they don't take the opportunity to recognize that the cash flow is not going to be there consistently. So yeah. they don't do what you mentioned earlier, which is eliminate waste. Yeah. But what drives me nuts about that, again, it's a political issue, right? Because the politicians have not allowed for, or not allowed for, supported, or paved the path of greater diversity in economic situations. So there's really no other industries, like in Calgary, except the Stampede. Um, and so you have this you have this situation where now you're, you're you're fully vested in this one vertical, and yet when you look at what these politicians are arguing about and talking about, it's the most stupidest things. I shouldn't say stupid things. The most Bam. irrelevant, non-priority things. Like you know, there's a big thing about um, uh, you know should 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 Muslim women uh, what's it called? Farad, yeah. 
should yeah. they remove their veil when doing this ceremonial thing? Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, are you kidding me? This is what we're talking about? Yeah. Someone's, someone's individual rights that have no bearing whatsoever <clears throat> on any of the political situations? Yeah. It's just insane. That's why I hate politicians. <laughs> <laughs> no, you hate people. <laughs> oh. Because that's how that's how people are, right? They 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 get power and they want more, and it never stops. Um, but that's really depressing. So don't even think about it. In fact, edit out the last minute. Of yeah, yeah. Let's just eliminate that. Let's talk about something cool you you posted on the show notes, which was that graphic I saw on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, how to lead introverts and how to lead extroverts. Um, uh, it's a great guide, and uh, you know, I'm planning this all-employee meeting at the end of November, and I'm really, ha I'm really struggling with this because I'm definitely the one on the left, the extroverts in the blue there. Wow. Uh, and the people on the right, I have a hard time. Like some of the feedback we get from engineers is, is hey, I want to, I want to make sure that I meet people that I wouldn't normally meet. But I'm an introvert, and I'm like, ah, that sounds like a problem you need to overcome. I, need, <laughs> I can't do that for you, but. Uh, I think that this graphic actually really helps me understand like where they're coming from, and, and that is such an essential key in the new space, in the DevOps world, is just being cognizant of other people's needs, being mindful of other people's needs when you're planning, when you're planning meetings, when you're assigning work, when you're setting expectations, etc. And do you know why, though? Do you know why it's so it's such a, a point of conversation in DevOps? Because it's not personal, it's business. No, it's the opposite. It's not business, it's personal. It's even it's even above that. Good for us. Yeah, so I haven't seen um, your graphic yet, but um, a really great read I felt that kind of helped me understand that was the book called Quiet. Uh, by it's it's a book, um, The Power of Introverts. Um, and, and it kind of talks about how these guys make a difference and how to work with them and all of that. It's by Susan Cain. And I felt that that was a really good read. So um, it kind of made me appreciate, you know, where their stance are, where they're coming from, and <laughs> in a world that can't stop talking, that's what it was. So the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. <laughs> so I definitely picked up some, some good tips from that book as well. It's a great read. Yeah, so I found that I found that picture particularly interesting because I'm uh, clearly in this space. I am bipolar. I am sometimes exceptionally ext extroverted. I, I I can do a podcast like this, and people say, "Oh, wow, you you've got no problem speaking in front of other people or getting up in front of a stage of five thousand people." But when I have to sit and really solve a problem or really solve a challenge, I can't do anything else. I shut down. I have to internalize. I'm exceptionally introverted. I need that leave me alone, quiet space kind of stuff. And it's and it's funny, too, because even like through all of ITSM Weekly, when we were recording that with Chris, because he's so extroverted, he would throw things out, and I would shut down on the show. I go back and watch the show sometimes. I see myself shut down on the show because I started thinking about the problem. <laughs> I couldn't stay in the moment. Uh, you know, so I feel I feel for this slide because there it is when you are introverted, it is a challenge to express your thoughts, and it's been, it's been a it's been a conscious discipline for me to get out of that. And I've told people if you knew me 20 years ago, I am nowhere near who I am today, um, and for the better. Uh, I'm I'm glad to have gotten out of my shell, though I appreciate all the skills I have as an introvert, which is I really think through things. I have the ability to simulate a situation really super fast because I can put myself almost to the point where I talk to myself and I'm actually moving my hands when I'm thinking because I put myself in that world and scenario so much, which is a skill introverts have and you have to capitalize on it. Yeah, that's what it comes down to is being able to capitalize on the skills uh, and being able, to, being able to switch between the two without having to identify it. You don't have to have everyone get up and say, hi, my name is Matt and I'm an extrovert. You, right. you don't have to do that. You don't make people categorize themselves even. But still, you have to be, like, conscious of it. Well, it's, it's, it goes for anything. In, introverts, extroverts, those who have a dominant personality versus one that is more conscientious. I mean, there's Berkman, there's DISC. And yeah. I feel like understanding the more, in, you know, intelligence or – it's kind of related to emotional intelligence, right? So the more that we have insights about each other and the different – ways within the which we interact and we do work or we communicate, I think the more strength it brings to a team because then you can pull out how you can work 
effectively with that person, right? And that's exactly why it's a topic of conversation in the DevOps world because I, and I love this about DevOps. It always comes down to one simple thing, flow. Mm -hmm. Anything that makes something slow is the enemy. Healthy conflict can actually make things faster because you don't have to do the rework. You hashed out all the issues up front. But emotional conflict or personality conflict makes things slower. So if you understand how to interact with somebody and build that strength in team, it builds the flow. Yeah. Which, you know, again, it's it's all about speed of execution. And what I what I love about these tests too, and my, my son got really big into the Myers Briggs, I turned him on to disc, and he got really big into that. Is as he was starting to psychoanalyze everybody else, he started to really appreciate who he was and who he wanted to be. And he's made the changes in his life and then become this different type of person and uh you know, he recently just moved out of the house back to Massachusetts because uh, he's going to school online. And, it, and it's like he's taking adventure and he's being all the things that he, he realizes he wouldn't naturally be. And I love that. Right? We push ourselves beyond that opportunity. And I wish that we had people in IT who are willing to do that more. Like just not accepting that someone says, hey, this is the change process or process. And, and, and run... And, and, and look at and look at what is it accomplishing and why is it why is it slow or fast or what risk does it really mitigate or you know really taking this time to do that we don't see it enough I think and and I think that comes from leadership too right so at Emory we went through the disk assessment Myers Briggs we had to do the Berkman colors and they placed you know emphasis on that I think uh, traditional IT organizations the, their people are forced to just be in constant you know get work done mode and we don't necessarily invest the right amount of time in building our teams. Like, how cool would it be if you, before you start a new project, you build a team and you say one of the first things we're going to do before we go and dive into project planning will be to actually go and do one of these disk assessments and see where we fall and how we can prepare and mitigate the people risk, you know, before we form as a team. And did you put the letters on your doors? How far did you get down that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So at Emory, we all had our, um, we all kept our uh, card, our Berkman cards on our uh, doors or cube walls, and you know we took it. I think we take it each year, or every other year. So there's a, it's a huge emphasis. And what were you? A C? <laughs> no, I was an I actually an influencer. <laughs> so I was a dominant I, and then I had uh, D was my secondary. Interestingly enough, so there you have it. <laughs> yeah. And what I found interesting about DISC is the letter wasn't necessarily for the person. The letter was for anybody who had to interact with that person. So as you were approaching that person or as you were going to ask them to do something or as you were going to complain about their work or, or try to get them <laughs> to do something, you knew how to phrase. Absolutely, and yeah. it's so important. Like I still, and I miss those, that's what I miss about those days is because and you change, like even um, with my disc, I always stayed an I and then a D, but with the Berkman colors, so I think blue is strategic, green your communicator, red your operations get things done, and yellow I think you're something to do with process. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, at first, my first year at Emory, I was largely a blue, and ironically had very little red, and I was like the service operations manager, which was kind of funny. But um, by year three at Emory, my blue was still the dominant one, but I had increased my intensity in some of the other colors, and so the it shifted. And it was always neat to see when they made us go through the exercise and team events. After you know, you, you do the they take you through workshops and do little examples and line people around the room based on their color and do these like scenarios where okay, now you're going to go and complain about this person's work. Now that you know, you know how they are, how would you approach the conversation and it's you. You learn a lot, you know, and I feel like that makes a big difference in how big difference in how you work with your team. Yeah, yeah sure. and we're back to the Sims that we started out the episode with. Yeah. Really, just trying to make sure that people understand how to work with each other, and I really I liked that concept that Zappos came up with about just addressing conflict. Um, and there's really there's so much good guidance about this stuff now, only because people have started to talk about what DevOps actually is and we're all figuring it out that it's the people. It's not even it's not even the technology. And now that in earlier in the podcast we noted that technology is going to be doing the technology part. It really is all about people. So be good to yourselves and be good to each other because you're all that you've got. And good to your technology because it's going to rule you someday. 
<laughs> there will be no more work for humans. <laughs> and that's how you hack business technology. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all.